It is Christmas. It's kind of hard to get used to that idea. Have you, have you made your list yet? Already made your list? I made a, you know, uh, ask you if you already got your, some, anybody finished? There's two, three hands that are finished. That's amazing. And, and the funniest part of it, I think it's Libby's the one who raised her hand, so it must run in the family here um, with mom and daughter that are, are, are done. You, know, you make these lists and you think, what am I going to get? And, and you, people are asking you, and you maybe the person doesn't like to have a list whatsoever you know, for Christmas time, and they keep bugging you. What do you want? What do you want? I don't know. I don't know what I want. And it's just hard to create this list. But in your mind, I remember as a kid, you made this list of things that, that you would want for Christmas because it's an important time of year. We, we, we are... We, let's admit it, no matter what your age is, we like getting gifts. Amen? We like unwrapping things. We like receiving things. We like people buying us things, and we like that time of year. I got a question for you this morning. Can anybody remember what was on last year's Christmas list? Anybody at all? Can you remember what was on last year's Christmas list? This is a participation time, so right? Beth, kind of, maybe, but can you name one? Beth Brewer? For, for a long time. So it was on last year's list, carried over to this year's list. It could be carried over, over to the next year's list. And so uh, we won't tell him, okay? Everybody, shh. Can't share that information. Don't want to do that. Isn't it interesting, though, as much energy as we spend in to purchasing and buying and making lists that we don't remember last year's list? We don't remember the things we put on there. I think it's quite interesting of our, of our heart and our mind that, that we do chase after things. We spend a lot of energy on chasing things that don't last. We may not even know where they're at. You may be wearing a Christmas gift right now and you don't even remember if it was a Christmas gift or not. You, you have no clue of where, where things were. Do they even work? Are they broken if they're your kids' toys? Every year you tell yourself this. They, you could have bought boxes and they've been just as happy, you know, than if, if it was just an item. Or toy. When they're older, of course, that doesn't, that doesn't carry over as well. But we do have a tendency to pursue the, these things of this world. What if I told you that there was another list that had your name on it? And it's a list I think that God has for you. A, a list that God has made that says, I have gifts for you, and here's my list. Now, immediately you may be thinking of the negative, because we kind of do that when we think of God's list, don't we? We're like, yeah, I'm sure he's got a list of things I shouldn't do this and shouldn't do that, and he, he like, you know, no, 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 no. This is a list of the goodness of God's heart that he wants us to have. And this month, we're going to work our way through the Christmas story, and the next four weeks, in the midst of the 20th, and then in the 27th as well, just of gifts that I think God has on his list for us, if we'll accept them, if we'll embrace them. And he says, I want to offer these to you, and they're valuable, and they're important. We, we begin this morning in Luke chapter 1. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, you will see that... Um, Well, eventually, beginning to, to Mary's song uh, out of verse 46 and following, but there in the middle, we see Luke chapter 1, and all the Gospels really begin out of silence. The Christmas story begins out of silence. God has been silent. God has not been saying anything, and the nation of Israel has been, been wandering in their own minds, and their hearts, their faithfulness. Rome is there now the empire that's in charge. They're in slavery. They, they are, find themselves... Um, surrounded in an environment that is not even honorable to the Lord at all, and they, they want to be free. The only thing out of the silence is being heard is the nation of Israel themselves crying out to God to free them. Release us from this bondage. Send us this promised one that you had, the prophets of old had spoke of. Send him, and when he comes, then we will be released. When, when, when the Messiah comes, we will know salvation. We will be restored to our place of honor. When he comes, this longing in their heart, and the tradition, this is actually month of December, is this, uh, this Advent season, which actually means this longing for the coming of Christ. And there's this heart of redemption, and today I hope that we too are in Advent. In other words, we pray as our world going, Lord Jesus, come again, because he will come again. And his people need to be longing for him to come again. And there's this list that we, we remember that, that God wants for us, this, this transforming part of us. And, that, and that's what I want, our hearts to be really transformed this year by this, this the Christmas and the telling of, of this list that God has for us. You see, I think that it was on an unusual day, a common probably day for Mary, when Gabriel shows up 
I can't imagine that day. We can see that in Luke chapter 1 and the verses 26 and following. We see that here is Mary on this common day. Gabriel shows up and begins to tell her of something very unusual had come, that the Spirit would come upon her and that in some form she would become pregnant and then becoming pregnant even though she was a virgin, that there was this sense of overwhelming, how could this be? But it wouldn't be just an ordinary baby that she would carry. No, this would be Emmanuel. This would be the promised one. This would be the Son of the Most High. This would be the Son of God. And his name would be Jesus, taken from the Old Testament, Joshua, which means the one who comes to save. This is the one that she was, I can't imagine how, how she tried to work through all of this, but yet in her response to Gabriel, which amazes me, I would have had a thousand questions. I would have been wondering, how, why me? Why is this possible? Why, why this way? And all kinds of questions. But instead, she simply submits and says, uh, as you have spoken, may it happen to your servant. What incredible heart of just submission that Mary demonstrates there. And then, of course, going to Elizabeth, and as she goes to Elizabeth, who actually in her old age also is pregnant, and that's a totally different story altogether. Don't need to get into that one this morning, but yet she's carrying John the Baptist, and when Mary comes to her, Elizabeth, through the Spirit, knows how we'd have no clue, but Elizabeth knows how favored she says to Mary when she enters that the, son, the, the mother of the one carrying the Son of God has come to visit me. And even John the Baptist in a womb leaps at that moment. You see, all this is to take place. All this is leading to this moment in Mary's life that this, this response is just like swelling up in her. This, this how she's dealing with this, this uh, change of her life and forever of her life. And all of a sudden, we see this beautiful song that rises up out of Mary in verses 46 and following. Follow along, if you would. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm, and he has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and to his descendants forever, and even as he said to our fathers. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. What a beautiful song that pours out pours out of Mary. And here I think we get really the first gift that I think that is on the list of Christ. The list that God has for us, and it's this. It's a heart of worship. Because that's what we really see here out of Mary. This, this heart of just poured out worship of who God is. And it's this, from the depths of her heart, she wants to realize that, that, this, that no matter what occurs, no matter how this is supposed to happen, no matter what changes occurs in her life, worship is the foundation that comes out of her. And that's what I want for my life. I think that's what God wants us for that life, our life. It has been a, a vital part of the relationship between God and man, worship. It's how, it's how we, we respond in, to God who loves us. It's the way, the way that he set his commands up, even the first command saying, saying that thou shalt have no other God before you. This was important value between God and us. We even see in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, before the Israelites would pray, they would, they would quote this part of the prayer, but then they would also go on. It's a part we're very familiar with as well, which says, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today to be in your heart. It's this idea that worship is a foundation. He is the one and only to be honored, to be lifted up, to be, to be worthy of, to be praised. And a lot of us, we, as we worship him for many, many years, many times we, we worship on a, on a Sunday morning, but not Mary. This was something more than just one hour of a day. This is a heart that worships 24-7. Notice the terminology she uses there in the first verse. My soul glorifies the Lord. This is also called the Magnificat in its Latin form. It has a great history. 
and Catholicism. It has great, great, just so much to this song that she sings. But just this idea that, that we need to meditate on this thought that my soul magnifies, glorifies the Lord. The emphasis in this sentence, however, is not Mary, nor is it the magnifica magnification or the glorification that she desires, but rather it is on the emphasis on the Lord himself. How wonderful he is, how beautiful he is, how gracious he is, how kind he is, the attributes of the one who leads us and guides us. And it's this, this desire that here's Mary, a common girl, young woman, from the proper line of David, but yet she herself is just an ordinary girl, and yet her heart desires to, mag to make him known. And that's what this magnification does. Does my soul, it makes me wonder, is my heart of worship, do, does my life magnify God? Are people able to see God by how, not only just how I live, but, but how, what I speak of, how I speak of things? Do I speak of God as if he is actually engaged and involved in my life? Because those are all forms of worship. And when, I talk, when we talk about a worshipful heart, it is one that is, it is a, that is carried through all the days of my life. It's what we do tomorrow in a workplace. Do I have a sense of a heart that worships God in my workplace? Is my home a place of worship of which it, he is glorified and he is honored, he is made known? And that's what it means. I can be, I can be a follower and be a, a quiet follower. I can be silent, and people can even know, know that I'm a Christian and that I go to church, but if I live my life silently for God and at no point bring him honor and glory, then I, I still need to learn how to worship. I know I need to still, how to, I still need to learn how to worship. I want a heart that glorifies God. But how do we get that? How is a heart that glorifies God cr created? When we look at Mary's song, I think she gives us some ideas. She gives us some understanding. And, and go back and look at the, this, if you would, please. First of all, she, she not only says she wants to glorify him, her spirit wants to rejoice. But you notice there's certain terminologies and words she uses to describe herself. Humble, state of a servant. She uses the word humble. If you go back up earlier in the verse when she responds to Gabriel and when, when, she, when he announces to her that she'll be carrying a child, she simply says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. May it be as you have said. This servant terminology, this word servant has this idea of, of one who knows we got to remember who we are. And I think that's an important value when it comes to having a heart of worship. I've got to remember who I am before God. I can feel good, I can, I can think of myself as accomplishing a lot in, in our lives, and we've, we've done this, I've got that, I own this, and we can begin building our own little kingdoms of this world, and we can quickly forget who we really are when it comes to God. And the sense is that we lose that, and we cannot lose, we must remember who we are in our life. And Mary did not forget that, even though she was chosen. You know, you know how, um, you know, we could have become pretty prideful pretty quick. Think of all the women of Israel. And you had heard these words, you have been chosen over all of them, over all of them. Well, la di da Right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it would not take me long in my humanity to go, hey, he didn't choose you, and he didn't choose you. And he, you know, when you're walking, hi, he chose me. Hi, you know, you, you could just all of a sudden become pretty arrogant in the fact that out of all, that you were the chosen to carry the Son of God. But that's not where she goes. She remembers, even in the midst of God lifting her up to this elevated position, she did not forget who she belonged to. She was the servant and he was the Lord. And it kept this worshipful spirit in her heart. She didn't become, as we might say, filled with herself. But rather, she allowed the spirit to be, be in her own heart. In Proverbs 16, 18, we see this when it says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And I'm telling you right now, if we, we become haughty, which means an empty building up of self, and that's kind of what it is, we end up lying to ourselves that we're more important and valuable than what we really are, then in that sense, our worship becomes so much less. We, we approach him more of a Pharisee does. Instead of worship him in his one as, as a servant's heart. And we must remember who we are, that we, we belong and we serve a mighty God and to keep that position. And so I think that's the first thing in order to have a, a heart that glorifies God, a heart that worships on a 24-7 basis. We've got to remember. Two is we, we, we need to, to worship 
heart of, of, of worship be, remembers what God has done in the past. I think we, we catch this, um, and I'm going to get into these, but five times Mary uses this phrase in the song, he has. That's past tense. And because it's five times, it tells us it's something we don't want to miss. He is constantly telling us what she is in her song, what he has done in the past. And it's a part of a heart that worships. It's a heart that remembers what he's done in our past. You know, it may be far past because some of the things refer to something that's done long ago. Some of it is near and close. And yet it is important for us to remember these things because what happens is when we begin to remember that what God has done, We not only pay attention to what God has done, but it draws our attention to his character. Because what God does, it comes out of who he is. It's not just acts of randomness. We see his patience. We see his provision. We see his love, his mercy, his grace. We see all those things taking very palatable things for us to see. And when we begin opening our eyes to see them, we begin collecting them and realizing, God, you're good. All of a sudden, we can worship by saying, God, how I thank you that you have been patient with me this week. Father, I thank you for your, your loving heart that you, you, have, you have not walked away from me, but your love has pursued me this week. When I wanted to quit, Father, you have, you have given me the strength, and God, you are my strength. I thank you. For, and so you can begin adding that list and, and designing that list of your own heart of, list, of worship. And I, and I think it's important for us to take a look at these five things that Mary has laid before us. Um, and the first one is this, out of Mary's list. Now, before I, before I go any farther, uh, this is where this comes in handy. If you flip, hopefully you got one of these this morning. On the back side, there are five questions. These five questions are parallel with the five statements that Mary makes in this song. Feel free to answer these questions anytime during the sermon, because what I want this to do is basically, you can listen to me, you can phase in and out, it's normal anyway, I know I'm a preacher, I know what happens to people, don't worry, I'm not offended, because what I want you to do, I believe that in order for us really to get a grasp of this, what God has done for me, it's good, when we answer these five questions, it will, worship will well out of you because you're actually spending some time processing through the things God has done for your life. Does that make sense? So I give you permission. If I see you writing, it's okay, because I know you're, hopefully you're not just doodling, uh, but you're, you know, that you'll actually be, be answering these questions and take a look at that. And the first one that we're going to look at is this, that he has, Mary makes mention here and of her list of he has been mindful. I like this. God has been mindful. In other words, of all history, God is a keeper of promises to the nation of Israel that they would be restored. To the promised land that gave it to Abraham, he was faithful. He did not forget them. When they were taken into captivity into Babylon, he did not forget them. But in 70 years, he, he told them, in 70 years you'll be restored. And when you look at the scriptures and you read them and you add that up, it was 70 years. And the first began to return back to Jerusalem, began to rebuild it. The remnant of those followers of Christ had come back. He was mindful of them and he promised them a savior. And what occurs in Luke 1, we see the savior, the good news. God in flesh came, Jesus Christ himself. He was mindful of them. And what would God be? Why is God mindful of us? Psalm 8 and Psalm 144 make references to this. I'm gonna read 144 verses three and four. And it says, Lord, what are human beings that you care for them? Mere mortals that you think of them, they are like a breath. Their days are like a fleeting shadow. What a great question. Why, why would God even be concerned about us? He's powerful. He's mighty. He's created the heavens and the earth. He's created everything. And he, even in the midst of creating us in his image, he has not fallen out of love with us. He still pursues us. He still keeps his promises. He is thinking of you. What, what a great thought. That in the midst of your hardships and your struggles and good days and bad days, to think God, you are on God's mind. I don't know about you, but that takes me out of, out of a lot of places I don't like to be into some great places of my heart and my life because God is mindful. He is, he is thinking of us. It is almost like I, I was thinking about this, how to explain this. If you entered into your house and your, your house was just torn up, I mean, there are, there are cushions everywhere, there are things off of shelves, your kids are running around, and you can tell they're looking for something. You're like, what are you doing? It's like, we gotta find it. 
I mean, we have got to find it. And what? What is lost? I mean, what, what have you lost that has you, required you to tear up this whole room? I mean, of course, as a parent, you're, you're like, you know, angry because everything's all tore up. And they run around and say, just look for it. Say, what? A penny. I, I lost a penny. What do you mean you lost a penny? I'm looking for the penny. Is it a special penny? No, it's a penny. And you would just scratch your head, wouldn't you? You would go, why are you doing this? Why are you, why are you doing going so much effort in the pursuit of a lost penny? That's kind of how it is with God. What we think has very little value. God has this desire to be mindful and not forget one little penny that's been lost. But rather pursue it. He's mindful. And so the question is this. How has been... How has God been mindful of you? How in your life have you thought, when has God really been mindful, has thought of me? And, and just begin answering that question. Mary goes on and says he's been merciful, meaning that he has really not given what Mary deserved. Did Mary deserve to be chosen? No. Mary, Mary was no different than any other woman. She was a sinful woman who needed a savior. She, in her own heart and mind, was not set apart in any way except for her servant's heart that God chose her, something about her, and God had mercy on her, and she knew that, and he said she was so grateful for his mercy. This mercy meaning that God was holding back what she deserved. It's a great word all through the Old Testament. We see this word of mercy, and occasionally we see the word grace. Grace comes in in the New Testament, and grace is the simple meaning of grace is that God gives us what I do not deserve. They go together very well. Mercy is God withholds what I deserve. Grace is what God gives me that I do not deserve. And here Mary goes, thank you for being merciful, Father. You've not dealt with me the way I deserve to be dealt with. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Romans chapter 8, verse 23, how we, we see here that Paul is struggling, is, is trying to help him understand this mercy of God and, and the Jews and the Gentiles, and he begins quoting Hosea. I'm just going to read verses 25 through 26. I think there's more up on the screen from 23, but I'm just going to start at verse 25. And it says, he, is, he says in Hosea, I will call my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one, who is not my loved one. And I, and in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. It's amazing that Mary knew she had been lifted to a position she did not deserve. And if we wear the name Christian, follower of Christ, whatever title you want to carry yourself, you have been lifted to a position we do not deserve. Christ has lifted us, and we ha God has been merciful to us, and he does not give us day in and day out what I deserve. Rather, he has shown his mercy and his kindness and goodness. And so in your mind, when is God not giving you what you deserve? When is, when is he withheld instead of poured out? The third thing is this. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. Really interesting that part of the song. I, I, I was thinking of that, uh, as I was processing through this, I was thinking it's interesting that God created by word. You know, the mighty things we think about of creation, the heavens and the earth, the, the planets and everything involved with it and everything that's going, he created it by speaking we see in Genesis. But when it came to the salvation of man, when it comes to restoring that which was broken, when it comes to my sins being forgiven, when it came to that, why did he not speak that? Why did God not choose to simply say they're forgiven? Why did he not speak and it become a reality? It's because God wanted to reveal himself through his son in order that he may have, we may have everlasting life. He came in order that he may be the sacrifice that is required in order for us to know God, in order to have that forgiveness. And the mighty works of his arm, I love this part of the song, the mighty art, art work of his arm. And when I think of that, I think of the hands of Jesus. I think of them nailed on the cross. I think of the mighty work of the cross 
cross that Jesus went to in order that we may have everlasting life. I think of those mighty hands and those mighty works for my sake because he was mindful of me that I would be born thousands of years later. It did not stop him because when he was on that Christ, he was mindful of each one of us and the generations to come and the generations to come. And he did not forget us. And this is our Jesus, and this is what he has done for us. He has come to this earth that we may have everlasting life in his great and mighty arms. Have been pierced in order that we may know grace. Is there a reason to worship him? Is there a reason for our heart to be overwhelmed? Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrated his own love in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What mighty deeds has God performed on your behalf? I I pray that you just begin writing those down. The fourth thing, he has brought down rulers. I like this because it reminds us that the act on the cross followed by the empty tomb. They go together. Both of them reveal overcoming. And it's here we see that Jesus Christ has overcome the evil one who was prideful, not submissive. Remember, as a matter of fact, even that that verse I read uh, read to you out of the Proverbs about um, the pride and the haughty, those are all reflections and qualities we see in Satan himself. But here we see that God calls us, that tells us that, that he has brought down these rulers. That's important to know. That's important for us to remember today that God has not only demonstrated his love to us on the cross through Christ and through the empty tomb, but that empty tomb tells me that he has overcome the thing we fear the most. Ask your people. Ask people you go to work with. Ask neighbors. Go ahead. Just simply ask them what they think about death. They will avoid the question. It'll be the most awkward moment of your life. What do you think about death? We see it all the time. We hear about it all the time. We don't talk about it. Our culture does not talk about death. Because if we talk about death, then we have to deal with God. But the reality is, death itself has been overcome. Death itself has been beaten. And Christ lifts us up to a place that not only has he conquered, but we too have conquered. Romans 8 continues with saying, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor the height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is power in overcoming, and he has brought down the evil one. And that's important for us to understand and ask this question. The answer is, what has God brought down to lift me up? And the fifth thing is this. He's filled the hungry with good things. He has filled the hungry with good things. Christ teaches us that blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. God gives good things. Anything that's good in your life? Go ahead and make a list of it. Write it down. Think through it. What's good? Home, family, house, roof. There's a lot of details of goodness in our lives. And that comes from God. It comes from his heart and his desire for us. And we need to be cognizant of what God is doing. And so we need to answer the question, what good things have I experienced that God has provided? Even a conversation with your son or daughter. That was so good. That two minutes where we set our phones down and actually had a face-to-face conversation, that was sweet. I know I'm not going to get it for the rest of the day, but God, I'm I'm thanking you for that good thing that just happened. My child sleeps longer than two or three hours. I'm thinking of you, Austin and Julie. I'm praying for that too. It's a good thing. There's so many things when we stop and think about it that God gives us that are good. When we look at the answers of these questions, and I I encourage you throughout this month, sit down, take some time, morning devotions, maybe just take one and answer just one of them and just pray over the, whatever you write down, just begin worshiping God over how you've answered that question. And by the end of the month, just simply have answered all five of these, that what God is doing, and then let that be a discipline as you prepare to come in as a community of worship, that you bring all of this in. And when we sing and when we commune and we meet around the table, it's, it, you're ready to give because that's what worship is. Worship is about what we come to give, not receive. 
When we come and meet as a community, we come to meet as a community to give God honor and glory, our heart, our voice, our praise, and that carries out into our, what we do day in and day out. And that's what we are called to do, to lift up Christ, to worship him because we know him, because we're remembering him, because we, we know he is involved in our life and we fall in love with him. And I'm telling you right now, it's much easier to share the love of Christ with somebody when you're in love with Christ. Those are important things to remember. Rick Martin, this past week before Thanksgiving, had, had sent me an email as a, as a friend of mine, and he said, uh, it's interesting the difference uh, he remembers of being taught about Thanksgiving, which fits into this worship component, is that he, he knows now that we ask the question, what are we thankful for? And you may have even asked that during Thanksgiving and even thought of that. What are you thankful for? And Rick said the thing that was different from him growing up is that what he, whether it was taught or however this came about in his own life, he said it was a different question. It was, who are you thankful to? And I never thought the drastic difference between those two statements or questions. Because one draws our attention to the things the other draws our attention to the one who gave them. And when we forget, when we really forget and do not ascribe to the Lord what he is deserving to him, what belongs to him, then all of a sudden we begin to distance ourselves from him, believe it or not. God even warns the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy 6. Here he, he's, he's telling them, matter of fact, this great passage, Hero Israel, I read it before, we're going to hear a little bit more of it later, but he goes on to say in verses 10 through 12, chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, verses 10 through 12, he says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant, then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Could it be that we have enjoyed the blessings of the Lord so much that we have forgotten him and have not allowed ourselves to have a heart of worship? Now, this, the last thing I want to make out of, um, last point of this, of this beautiful song, it's this. That worship continues in spite of not having clarity. I find that interesting. Worship wasn't conditional. Worship wasn't on how is this going to work. Because you've got to understand, Mary being pregnant with a husband-to-be was just giving a, a, basically a time bomb ready to possibly go off in her life. By law, she could have been stoned. This statement of joy also came with some concern and sorrow. But Mary did not come out of her this worry or how do I control this. Mary's heart said, I'm going to worship you even though I don't understand how it's going to happen. How is, how is Joseph going to handle this news? Could you imagine preparing for that conversation? Could you imagine building up for that moment of saying, Joseph, i got to tell you something. And even in the midst of that struggle, Joseph himself, and God dealt with him. God, and of course, what did Joseph do? He, he not only stayed with Mary, but took her as his own. He did not abandon her. He did, but Mary didn't know that at this point. Mary didn't know that was going to happen. Mary didn't know how, what her parents would do. Mary didn't know what Elizabeth would do. Mary didn't know what her whole community would do. But she knew, believed in a God who had done all these things in her past, and she put her whole stock and faith and life in that God was involved in this, and he's going to carry it through to the very end. And that's what God does. Even though I may not understand it, even though it may be a time that's tough and it's difficult, and I don't agree with what's going on, I will still worship you. We see that as Paul and Silas in the book of Acts, they had the same heart. They were thrown in prison because of, of teaching Jesus Christ. And what do they do at midnight? What are they doing? They're worshiping. They're worshiping. They're not complaining. They're not griping. They're not, not, not throwing, trying to say, well, I'm not going to follow him anymore because this is what happens to you. You end up in jail. No, they worshiped. It's because they had a heart of worship. So this is, this is just my prayer. That as we look through these characters, that we begin saying, God, 
I, I need this. This is something you have on a list for me. I want to have a heart that worships you, sees you, acknowledges you, lifts you up. I, I want a soul that magnifies you, God, and a world who needs to see him. So this Christmas, in the midst of all that we do, let us never forget the one who's given us everlasting life. Let us commit ourselves. Let us simply say, Lord, here, I'm your servant. Let's pray.